there's quite a lot of technical material to, to get through today. Um, so um, Neil and I will, will split this session. He will do um, a slot on, on barley in the middle, um, and I'll do wheat uh, at the beginning, and then finish with uh, something on oilseed rape and uh, integrated pest management. Um, and as we always try and do, I mean, it's important when you're looking at the disease data that I'll present from last year that you have the context of what last season was like. So I'll talk a little bit about what made last year um, peculiar in its own way, um, and then try and pick out the specific messages that there is a lot of data um, from trials last year. So we'll try and pick out the kind of key changes uh, and what you need to take forward into, into 2018. Um, and then finish with, you know, as I say, something on integrated pest management. We'll say quite a lot about fungicide resistance as well, because with new products and new efficacies, there's also, you know, the, the flip side of that coin is, is products that start to, to slip and, and lose their efficacy. And you need to know about that. So, I mean, we're all special in our own way. Every season has its own twists and peculiarities. Um, so, I mean, in general, we have this trend of early drilling crops, um, you know, a, a gently warming climate. So we uh, tend not to get the hard winters. Uh, we get warmer autumns and winters. So we're carrying a, a higher, you know, the, these are generalities, but in general, we're carrying a higher disease burden in crops. We have a history of growing weak, uh, high yielding varieties that carry a lot of disease, and we've relied on fungicides to manage that. And somewhat inevitably, that's given us these problems with, with fungicide resistance. Um, so last year, um, we had that phenomenally dry spring that kind of, you know, a year ago, I was saying we had a lot of disease coming over winter. Um, that dry spring did knock things back. So again, a lot of the disease data that we look at today, it wasn't the most extreme season. Um, we were working generally in a more preventative way. So keep that in mind when you're, you're looking at the results. And that just illustrates what I've said. So you've got there the, the winter temperatures and the spring temperatures from, from last season. So significantly warmer at that point, which you know, meant we came into the spring carrying quite a lot of disease in winter crops. And that chart was just, you know, illustrates the extremely dry spring. Um, so not quite, you were um, not quite as dry in, in the April, not quite as dry in the April in the Northeast here. Um, but you can see how that carried into the May. So that did kick back on, on disease. Like everything, averages tell you absolutely nothing at all because it then, if you look at the average rainfall for last year, it's pretty much spot on. And it was a really difficult harvest for many, and particularly here in the, in the northeast, really catchy conditions. And that's you know, persisted over the, the autumn uh, and winter period. That said, we've had some reasonable frosts we're not carrying a particularly high disease burden at the moment, so I don't think it's the worst disease year that we've, that we've had. And we've talked before in wheat about the need to treat by leaf layer. Um, so because of that erosion and efficacy, we're very much about trying to treat preventatively and target those key leaves on wheat. Uh, and I don't need to lecture you about this, but I mean, when you look at how growth stages uh, on this axis uh, change uh, between seasons. So these are from our adopted uh, monitor crops that we do for Scottish Government. If you pick something like stem extension in wheat, that varies by as much as a month um, between these advanced and, and slow seasons. So it really is about walking crops and looking at these key stages. And if you look at the disease pressure on wheat last year, we, we came over the winter carrying that endemic burden. But actually, you know, there's you know, leaf, uh, ear emergence in, in trial crops untreated, and it's still clean to the floor. Um, but if you flip forward a couple of weeks to um, early grain filling, you can see how much septoria popped out late. Um, so it was there in the crop. It's just that dry spring held it back. So if I shift into the, the fungicide performance trials, um, we don't often present you the sort of background um, generics of, of how the trials are done, but I thought it was useful just to cover that. So you can see that we've got six sites in the UK focused on septoria, so that's our key target um, in wheat. And then you've got yellow rust, brown rust, and fusarium in that mix as well. And we have a site in Ireland that they self-fund, which adds to the database. And the trials are odd in that they're 
single treatments, so that's quite a big ask of a fungicide, one shot in the season. And then we sort the data into whether the leaf was emerged at the time of treatment so that we can sort the data into protectant or eradicant because there are big differences in how products perform in that, in that sense. So if I dive into these curves, you know how they work, but the best products give you good control at the lowest possible dose rates. So effective products fall into this corner here. And we've got the, the mixed products on this side of the chart and straight products here. So if I start with the straights, keep things simple. So here's your two azole products, proline and ignite, prothioconazole and epoxyconazole. And we're looking protectantly here. So this is how you want to be working. So we've had a couple of years where proline has come quite far ahead of epoxyconazole. Last year, they were much closer together. So they're very evenly matched. Here's your two straight SDHI products. They're four examples. We can only keep a limited number of products in trials. Um, so Imtrex pulling ahead as, as the strongest uh, SDHI. There's Vertizan. Here's Bravo, this multi-site that we are so reliant on now. It's, it's no better than it ever was, but it's really key in your programs as we start to lose efficacy in other products. So here's some of the newer SDHI azole mixes. So you've got the Salatinol uh, mix. Uh, this is a higher dose SDHI product and mixed with Prothio. And here's a mix with Metconazole. Really, the message from that is how close together they are in terms of efficacy. So that's just a cost-based decision for you, um, what they're available at um, and how you would use them. So if we flip into curative activity, um, so you see immediately that the curves start to lift away um, from that good corner of the chart. Uh, and we do separate pro proline here, so prothioconazole is pulling ahead. Um, and you see, interestingly, Librax pulls ahead in that situation, so slightly more curative power. If you look at average data over years, so it doesn't pull quite as far ahead, but that's, that's interesting. And there's the yield. So again, bear in mind that this is a single hit. Um, you can see the sort of yield lifts that we're getting. So again, these SDHI azole mixes, very easily matched. And here's your straight products here. And really, you know, we'll come back to the importance of using these mixed um, approaches and not exposing our chemistry or the individual by using uh, unbalanced mixtures. So if I move into rust, and obviously you get lots of warning that yellow rust is moving up the country. Um, last year we had more in the northeast than for many years, so particularly in sites with high humidity, um, so surrounded by trees and things. Um, rust is one of these ones that early season you might be factoring into a T0 decision. Um, and if you look at the, the survey data from the, the serial pathogen virulence survey, if you remember a year ago, we had this big influx of new yellow rust races. So we didn't know how varieties were going to be behaving um, when we came into the spring. We'd had big tumbles, so varieties like Myriad fell from a, you know, an eight or a nine down to a four. So with that insecurity, there was a bit more need for t naughts to, to manage rust. This year, actually, if you've drilled varieties that carry quite high ratings, um, so you can see there that, you know, you've got a lot of eights and nines. They should behave as you expect. So that adult plant resistance should pull through and, and you can be more confident that, that we're in a stable position this year. It's not to diminish the importance of rust. It's a big deal if you get it. Um, but varietal resistance is a, is a big help. Brown rust really is so rare in the northeast, I hardly need linger on this slide. Um, just to pick out that it is a known weakness of prothioconazole. Um, but actually, in a yellow rust receptoria situation, that, that's not a big deal for you. So if we look at the yellow rust efficacy, again, you can see you've got a good range of choices in those mixed chemistry. You're reliant on that azole base, and they're all very much of a muchness. Um, maybe one to pick out the straight products. Again, the, the straight STHIs, the, the Vertisan there, gives you some um, useful activity, but it's not its strongest suite. Um, comet, the strabilurins, so they are, you know, dead in the water when it comes to uh, septoria management, but they are still useful for yellow rust, and that could give you a bit of a break um, from azole reliance. And then fusariums can be a big deal for us, both in terms of direct yield losses, um, where they come in as ear blights, but also, obviously, they've got that nasty sting in the tail that they have issues with mycotoxins. Um, so, Again, we're reliant on azole chemistry at that point in the season. 
So we've got the four different azoles here, prothioconazole, epoxyconazole, metconazole, and tebuconazole. Now, prothioconazole gets a very good press for being the, the leader in, in terms of managing fusarium. But if we look at the year infection there, in fact, all the azoles are giving us good control in the trials. So that's a useful piece of information. Of course, you're often using mixed azole chemistry at that timing, so double dosing, which again um, can be helpful. If we look here at the three-year mean data, you do see the prothioconazole pull ahead. So it does remain the, the market leader um, for fusarium management. And then if we sort that into ear diseases are, are notoriously hard to do visually in the field. So if we sort it into the fusarium DNA uh, and the toxin level, so here you've got DON measured. Again, you can see the untreated controls and you can see the good level of control we're getting from all four of the azole products um, for, for both disease and toxin uh, control. So that's useful. That's an additional set of trials to the fungicide performance series, and it's, it's been very useful. So if I slip into maybe the, the less good news, um, I've talked a lot in the past about this decline in the azol efficacy. So we've been reliant on this group um, in wheat, often at four timings, uh, and we've seen this erosion in activity over a, a 15, 20 year period. And again, you see that it's more pronounced in the curative, the kickback situation. But actually, if I pluck a little bit of good news out of that, if you look at the last couple of years, um, you can see that, in fact, the, the situation seems to be stabilising a bit. That might be in part because we're using SDHIs in the programme, so we're not quite as reliant as we were. So the azoles remain really useful. They've had a very negative press because of the slippage, but they're still the backbone of your wheat programmes. They still bring you that security against a multiple number of diseases, so you're not just dealing with septoria. Um, so you know, don't um, sort of diminish their importance in, in constructing your, your programs. The less good news is that we're starting to see an erosion um, in the SDHIs. So if you remember, this new group was always flagged at being at moderate or high risk of resistance development. And we feared that they might go the way of the, the strabilurins and have a, a complete break, you know, a, a big step change in efficacy. That's not happened, but what you are seeing, if you look at these charts, you've got the, the maximum level of control, the average and the minimum. And what you see over the years is this spread in the max and minimum. So we're starting to see just a variability in their control. And we're seeing different mutations build up in the population. So really, wherever we look now, we can find mutants of septoria with some level of reduced sensitivity, albeit that it's not that dramatic. For me, that just reinforces the, the importance of using them in sensible ways and keeping um, that stewardship element in your program so you don't overexpose um, this particular group of chemistry. That particular one's looking at Imtrex. Um, similar story if you look at Vertisan, you start to see a spread in the activity uh, that we're getting from that SDHI. So then you think, oh, well, that's jolly interesting, Fiona, but how does that relate to what we do in the field? So actually what you do in the field makes a big difference to the population of septoria that you've got. So this chart is looking at isolates that we've sampled from the fungicide performance trials. And they've had, um, we've taken different isolates. So this just sets out all the isolates we've picked out of trials. They've, they've ha they're either untreated or we've picked them from plots that have had epoxyconazole or an SDHI. And immediately you can see, so isolates here are very sensitive. These ones are drifting a wee bit you can see that the ones that have had a single hit of an SDHI have moved to that end of the chart, which we don't want. They've just shifted. It's not dramatic, but they have moved. So what you do in the field makes a difference. And this one, again, this is taken from uh, the data provided by Bart Fry at, at Rothamsted. Um, and again, this is just setting out isolates against a, a, you know, a, a time span. So if you look at when we first introduced the SDHIs, um, there, you know, there's a range, but they're sitting here. And if you look at where we were in 2017, you can just see that slight drift to an end of the chart that, that we don't want. Now, we always joke that where the Irish go, we follow. I mean, they have big issues in managing septoria um, and some of their azole issues, you know, we are now experiencing. So it's useful to look at where they are at with SDHIs. And you can, in fact, see that while we show, saw a shift last year, they saw that shift in 2016. So you can see, again, their data starting to, to separate. 
Now, this chart looks a wee bit complicated, but I'll talk you through it. So, for me, again, this translates into what would you actually do to manage the position in, in your own fields. So, here we've got uh, treatments applied to trials either at T1 or T2. So, we've got an untreated control here, and we were looking at mutant strains of septoria. So, you can see the mutations at this site we're running. Well, this is means we, we do this work with ADAS and with Chuggas. So, you can see mutants running along there in the untreated. Where we used products, so there's a, a treatment where we've done an SDH IASL treatment at T2, but not used it at T1. You can see that single hit of SDHI has pulled the population from 20% to 40% mutated isolates. So we've made a difference. If you look at this one where we've used an SDHI at T1, um, we've pulled the population even further. And again, that for me, it gives you, you're making a decision at T1 about the severity of disease that you're looking at and whether or not you really need to use an SDHI at that timing. You may well have to, based on the risk that you're looking at, but do bear in mind that you know, that is pooling the population in, in your field. Um, adding in the multi-site here, uh, you can see has, has moderated the position a little, but it's really that double hit that's, that's made the big difference. So that just summarizes um, what I've already said. I mean, we know the SDHIs are hugely active, but some evidence of a bit of a wobble in the data there. Um, those mixed products are all pretty comparable, um, and we're trying to use ASOs and multi-sites to, to manage that risk of SDHI resistance. Choice of products for rust. Um, don't forget about the strobilurins in that mix. And fusarium, we're reliant on ASOs, but again, you've got a bit of a choice uh, in that market. So it's then thinking, how do you put that together into programs? And what we're not good at at the moment is capturing the risk of septoria. We tend to treat fields pretty much the same across farms, across seasons, and across varieties. So how could you start to capture the value of more resistant varieties like Revelation um, compared to the weaker ones here? So we've got a trial series um, looking at different septoria risks and then trying to um, put numbers on to the value of these uh, different traits. So this data, our particular site is, is uh, in East Lothian at uh, Cold Shield. Uh, and again, the, the rainfall data from this site illustrates beautifully the very dry spring that we had and then the, the rainfall um, that came over the summer. Um, that was the date of our open day, that particular spike of rain. So it's the first time I've ever had to do a presentation in a shed for an open day. Um, somebody didn't like us. Anyway, that was the, the trial. And what we were doing here was you don't need to get bogged down in these programs, but we were putting in different weights of fungicides, so untreated right through to different doses and complexities of programs. So that was um, trying to see the value of fungicides in different risk scenarios. So if we look at what we had, um, where we had uh, late and early sown um, wheat. So again, you can see that there's a trend to lower septoria in the later uh, drilled varieties, which you probably know intuitively. But you see there the big uh, value that's attached to, you know, we're going six, uh, sorry, six, five, four in terms of varietal ratings. Um, so much less septoria in the, in the revelation. So it's about capturing that in, in the, the programs and inputs. Here we've got low uh, drilling densities and high drilling densities, so a nice, dense, humid crop. And you can see how much more disease we've got in that situation. Um, this is about green leaf area. So um, what we're seeing here is, again, the value of that varietal resistance, so much more green leaf in the, in the more resistant varieties. Um, and when we see that translate through into um, the yields that we were getting from the trials. Um, here we've got uh, the uh, high um, drilling density, but you can see the responses we're getting in the high-risk situations. So again, you probably know that intuitively, that your responses are higher where the risk of disease is greatest. But this is starting to give numbers to that, um, so we can see that sort of roll through into the programs that are developed. Um, again, there you see, you know, the six rating for, for revelation and um, with a much more modest yield response. So it's going to be about how we judge risk in, in, in winter wheat. We could see that, um, yes, the dry spring dried things up, but there was still plenty of disease there. Um, and those varietal differences were really 
useful in, you know, the difference between a four or five and a six might not sound great, but it makes real differences uh, in the field. Much higher levels of septoria in early sown plots. So again, we're never going to manipulate sow date in Scotland. We, we're always grateful to get a sow date, never mind waiting for a better one. Um, but you can at least sort your sites into the ones that you know you've late drilled in the second wheats uh, and the one that you know you've had to drill early and accept that you've got a higher risk there and tailor the programmes to that situation. Now, that's some of Neil's grisly pictures, so I'll leave you at this point and let Neil do his part of the double act. I'll start and see, see you, I think I'm on. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Morning, everyone. Thanks for the introduction. Um, not sure about the comedy double act. There's not so many jokes in my uh, presentation uh, this year. But as Fiona said, this is some of the grisly pictures uh, you'll be presented with. So when I was putting the slides together, as I said, there's not too many laughs to be found. So I'll just remind you of the first commandment. Thou shalt not shoot the messenger. Okay, so we're just reporting what we found in 2017. Okay, so Fiona's explained the whole premise and how the fungicide performance graphs are produced. So I'll briefly go through the results from 2017. Because of that dry spring, rhynchosporium wasn't a huge issue in the crops, but it was still present, and we still got some quite good data on the efficacy of... Um, sprays as rhynchosporium protectants in 2017. You can see on the left-hand side the STHI triazole mixtures still doing a very good job reducing uh, rhynchosporium. When you look at the three together, the preacts are probably slightly ahead of the other two. You look at the straight products on the right-hand side and you can see the MTREX pulling ahead of the proline. Comet and the Vertisan. Vertisan's slipped a bit. Comet, again, has some activity, but is not um, particularly effective against rhynchosporium in this situation. So that's 2017. When we look back for the three-year means, you can see the mixtures were much closer together, so we're seeing more separation between them. And in terms of the, the straights, you can see the proline was closer to the Imtrex, and it's probably starting to move back a bit. In terms of the Comet and the Vertisan, they were closer together, so it looks like Vertisan seems to be slipping a bit in this situation. That's controlling disease, but obviously the most important influence for you is the yield response. You can look at those yield responses. You can see a fairly quick response from the Preaxor, up to half a dose, but then the yield response seems to level off. Whereas you look at the other mixtures and you can see the Siltra still giving a yield benefit with higher dose rates. Okay. And in terms of the, the straight products, a low proline was outperformed by the Imtrex against Rhynchosporium. You can see it's giving a higher yield, and that probably reflects proline's general all-round performance against a number of diseases. You can see it as we go through these slides. It's a good all-rounder for controlling quite a lot of diseases, so still a valuable addition in your program. Okay? So we looked at the comet in some of these graphs. Fiona talked about the decline of the easels against septoria. Something we're concerned about is the decline of the QOIs or strobilunes against rhynchosporium. So Paul Gosling at HDB pulled the data together looking at the control achieved by a half dose rate of comet from 2001 to 2017. And you can see the control is slipping from nearly 70% to around about 40, okay? So something to bear in mind, if you are adding Comet into your program, don't be expecting that kind of response. You expect something more down about here. And if you look at the full rate as well, we've slipped from 80% in 2001, down to about just over 40. So it's around about 50% reduction in the QI efficacy. Fiona mentioned we tend to follow the Irish situation. There have been reports in Ireland of QOI insensitivity and some mutations appearing. 
the G143 mutation that confers resistance to QOIs. We are doing some testing at the moment to see if we have that mutation in Scotland to see if that's the cause of this decline in efficacy. Okay, so hopefully report on that next year. Okay, so in terms of disease in spring barley, the big talking point in 2017 was this uh, devil, Ramularia leaf spot. HDB have released a new fact sheet to help you recognize Ramularia in your crop with five R's to, to guide you. So you're looking for a reddish brown spot. It's rectangular in shape, restricted to the veins. It gives a nice clear edge to the spot. It's right through the leaf, so you can turn the leaf over and you'll see the same shape and necrosis on the other side, and you get a ring of chlorosis. You can't see it so well in that picture, but you get a yellow halo around the necrosis. Okay? So I've put the, the website address there, but you'll see more about it when you hear get press releases from HDB. Going around the recommended list trials in 2017, there was no problem in finding ram malaria. So just some pictures to remind you or scare you. So one of the things we want to help people or help you is to try and differentiate between ram malaria and other diseases. One of the common ones is old mildew lesions. So if you get mildew on a crop, if you have a susceptible variety, say for example, propino, and then you get heavy rainfall, you can get what appears to be necrosis. So a lot of people assume that's ramularia. It's not. If you turn that leaf over, it will look green on the other side, you won't see that necrosis through the leaf. Tan spot, it's again, it's necrosis, and we've seen a lot of it in the last two seasons. But if you look at the shape, it's more of an, an eye shape. It's not bounded by the veins, it has a darker center. Nip blotch is the only pathogen which will give you that sharp edge, but nip blotch tends to elongate up the leaf, so you can differentiate between that and ramularia leaf spot. Okay, Fiona and myself stood at the CEDOS event and stood on the HDB stand asking, uh, answering questions about barley fungicide performance and probably 80 to 90% of the questions we were asked were all relating to ramularia. We saw big epidemics across the UK. Farmers from the southeast of England who'd never seen it before were rushing to ask how do you control ramularia? Uh, what's the best fungicide to use? So the HDB produce a, a map which categorizes the UK into a number of risk regions. High, which unfortunately, unfortunately where we are, moderate and low. So we have a project trying to identify the risk factors uh, which affect ramularia epidemics, which has involved scoring all of the recommended list trials across the UK, looking at the weather variables throughout, seeing what influence they have on final disease severity. This map is go probably going to be a little bit out of date in that probably nothing is particularly low, but the high region, it's not as simple as saying that's a high risk region. Within that, there are regions where you get, we've seen consistently low disease levels. If you go north of Inverness, Hill of Fern, we see consistently low uh, ramularia levels. But if you come down here closer to Aberdeen, we see higher disease levels. So it's very much a case of local environmental factors which are going to influence uh, your final disease severity. And that makes producing a risk map difficult and challenging, but it's something which we need to work on and ha try and give a far more precise and informative map to help guide your management decisions. Okay. So in previous years, the fungicide performance curves for ramularia have looked somewhat similar to the curves you've seen. We highlighted the very good activity seen by the SDHI trials all mixtures. And on the right-hand side, we saw good activity from the proline and the orange line is the Bravo, the chlorothalonil. Okay? We didn't get any results in 2016. The Rhynchosporium came and took the trial. When you looked at the straight products, practically nothing. Chlorothalonil stands out on its own. Okay. This is a fungicide performance trial. It was done in Midlothian. 
We have another trial site at Lanark, which tends to get higher disease levels, so we replicated the trial because we were interested to see what we would see in 2017. And again, you can't see any differentiation between the products on this line. They've all got the same line. So what we're saying is to control ramularia, you must have chlorothalonil in your T2 timing. Do not expect any control from the triazoles or SDHIs. Okay. So this follows on from the situation which was reported in Europe, where they've seen this kind of uh, collapse in efficacy from the triazoles and SDHIs in southern Germany, in Denmark. So we're not alone in this problem. Some speaking to colleagues in Ireland, they think they're not quite as bad as that, but they'll not be far off it. So it's a big issue for everyone who's growing badly across Europe. But we shouldn't really be surprised. We had an early warning. We got a press release out in 2017. Fiona showed you some nice graphs of fungicide sensitivity of different septori isolates. This is another way of showing sensitivity of isolates. This is ramularia. What we're looking at is these boxes. So we're looking at three fungicides. This is 2012. Chlorothalonil, the black line in the middle of the box is the mean, so it's the average value. Chlorothalonil, fluxoperoxide, prothiaconazole. 2012, pretty much all the same. Good activity. As they move up the graph, it means they're becoming less effective against the fun in controlling the fungus. So 2015, the chlorothalonil's hardly moved. Fluxoperoxide had hardly moved. Prothiaconazole moved up slightly. 2016, we see chlorothalonil, pretty much the same, but there's a big jump in the fluxoperoxide, the SDHI, and a, a, also a movement with the, with the azole. Okay. So we were able to give warning in 2017. We've taken isolates from last year's trials. The SDHI is now somewhere up about here, and the azole's just around about here. So we're still seeing even more movement. Okay. So this is not a situation which looks like it's going to be a one-season wonder. It seems to be here to stay. Okay. So that's ramularia. Back to net blotch. We've looked at net blotch. This is 2017 results. You can see the mixtures giving fairly good control, up to 100% of the recommended dose. The mixtures, proline outperforming the other two. That's 2017. If we look back over the, the years and look at the single active products, you can see there's been a shift. We don't see that really good control we were seeing for 50% of recommended dose. There's been a slip, so you do get some efficacy, but not at the same levels seen. Okay. There are concerns about possible mutations against the SDHI, which is making them less effective. And again, if we look at the mixtures, you can see still giving reasonably good control at 100%, but the control at 50% is way down on what was seen in 2014 and 15. Okay? So something to bear in mind if net blotch is a particular issue where you're growing your barley. Okay, in terms of mildew control, you look at the mixtures, they're all giving reasonably good control. Siltra outperforming the Alatus and isopyrazam. If you look at the single mixtures, remember I said earlier about proline being a good all-rounder? It's even outperforming the specific mildew aside. Okay? So if you're using proline in your program, you're getting that efficacy against rhynchosporium and also good control of mildew. Okay? Tan spot, something we've, we've mentioned last year, something that was seen quite frequently in 2016. Again, probably after ramularia, the most... Um, common disease that I saw in the recommended list trials growing around the country. It's been noted to be on decrease in Europe. We know in, in yield and uh, wheat and wheat crops it can use yield losses ranging from three to fifty percent. The possibly two inoculum sources for tan spot one is possibly infected seed and the other is trash. So minimum cultivation and the, the rise in minimal cultivation was blamed for inoculum increase. Again, we're not sure where 
the tan spots actually coming from. And like the other diseases we've talked about, there are resistance issues. In Europe, there's been reports of um, resistance or mutations in Q against QOI and SDHI fungicides. So something to be aware of and something to look out for in your crop. Okay. Um, last year, we talked in great detail about integrated pest management and how we're trying to integrate a number of control measures into our uh, program to control diseases. So one of the things we've been doing this year is our number of spring barley trials, incorporating a diff different factors to give um, control. This is some results from a trial done in Midlothian. The major disease that we saw at this point was tan spot. So one, obviously, varietal control. And Fiona's going to talk about varieties after the coffee break. So think about the disease control you can get from your variety, differences between Concerto and Laureate. And you can see in terms of tan spot, Laureate was better than Concerto. So think about varietal resistance. Think about the fungicide program you're going to use. In this trial, we went for a cheaper uh, QI and triazole mix, and it actually performed as well as the more expensive Siltra uh, treatments. So think about that. Think about the disease problems you have. Think about what options you have in terms of chemistry. One of the things we're looking at as well is the influence of seed rate. If you're aiming for a specific population, so in this trial, the low seed rate seemed to give slightly less disease than the higher seed rate. Remember, the higher the seed rate, the denser the canopy, you'll get more of a microclimate, more surface wetness within the crop, more humidity. So think about that when you're picking a seed rate. And the other thing we wanted to look at, I've talked previously at these events about incorporating elicitors into a disease program, and here we're trying to combine them with different seed treatments. So this was comparing a number of seed treatments, some biological, some elicitors, and see how they did against an untreated. And also, once they'd been so, and then treating them differently, some were untreated, some had a further elicitor and reduced rate fungicide program, and some had a conventional fungicide program. Okay. And this is some results from 2017. We'll be taking this winter and spring barley trials on to next year to see if we can see um, some concrete results. But it's quite promising here. So this untreated seed here, no fungicide. The solid bar is ramularia in the trial. The yellow line is the yield, the final yield from the crop. So you can see no fungicide, no seed treatment, then a full fungicide then elicitor plus fungicide, you get good control of disease, and you can see that yield response. But look here with the elicitor seed treatment, the full fungicide against the elicitor plus fungicide, that's giving you slightly better disease control, but the yield response from the elicitor and reduced rate fungicide beats the full fungicide program. Okay? So that's half your fungicide use plus an elicitor and you're still getting that, ultimately, that good yield response. The elicitors seem to slightly than the biological seed treatment, but again, we'll repeat these trials in 2018 to make sure it's not just a, a one-off. Okay, so in summary then, we've talked about barley, we've mentioned rhinchosporium. There's good control available from Proline or Imtrex. If you want better control, think about Preaxa or Elatacera or Siltra X Pro. Watch out for that trend for decline with the comet. The net blotch, we see that reduced sensitivity to SDHI. It's now been confirmed. Probably best to go with a mixture. If net blotch is an issue, you will get some activity from the comet. Ramularia, the big story. Chlorothalonil is still effective. You need that chlorothalonil in at T2. If you don't have it in, your crop's in big danger. Okay? The SDHI and azoles gave poor efficacy in 2017 trials in the UK. In mildew, the cyflamid, most effective of the specific mildewicides, prothiaconazole, still very effective, and the SDHIs can give you something to the efficacy. So if we're thinking about the control going forward, our takeaway message is mixtures are essential in the face of changes with rhinchosporium, netbotch and ramularia. If you are going to 
use a T-naught spray, you need to walk the crop, walk, see what disease is present, think about the diversity of chemistry available, think about a cheaper option, something like a ciprodinol, possibly with a morpholine. In T1 timing, that's going to build a lot of your yield because it's responsible for keeping the grain sites active. So think about using the strongest mixtures at rates that you think will give effective control. And that's obviously based on the major risk. So you need to walk that crop, see what diseases are present, see what's going to be the major risk. And the T2, that's keeping the lid on the other disease, and that's giving you protection against the ramularia. And that's where you need your chlorothalonil. Okay. So that's the end of the, the bad news, and I'll hand you back to Fiona for some more seed rape. Thanks, Neil. Yes, I can't promise, <coughs> can't promise this is loaded with good news either, but I'll do my best. Um, so obviously, likely spot your major foliar target um, in seed rape in a, you know, a particular high-risk region in the, in the northeast here. Um, and one of the key questions that we get, I mean, obviously, we, we manage light leaf spot uh, primarily with azole chemistry again, uh, and usually with uh, an autumn spray provide, uh, applied preventatively. So again, preventative use is much more effective than trying to work retrospectively with light leaf spot. That autumn spray followed by uh, a stem extension spring spray. And it's a very common question is, you know, do I need two sprays, and if so, which one? And the answer, sadly, varies with the seasons. So in seasons where the light leaf spot is there early, then the autumn spray is, you know, obviously working well preventatively and, and is very effective. Last year, 2017, gives us an example of that. So we had quite a lot of disease in the autumn of 2016. Um, so if you look at the trial series here, untreated controls, the trials have an overspray in November, and then we look at the experimental treatments in the spring you can see that the bulk of the disease control came from that November overspray, and there's very little additional control from that spring spray. So not big differences from a trial point of view last year, but that gives a really useful message as to the value of that preventative uh, November spray. Um, in seasons where you know, the disease is late, then yes, a spring spray might be the, the right answer, but if you know, you're, the horse is long bolted, um, if you if you wait and then the disease appears in that, in that gap. That looks at the yield benefit, which just reflects the disease control I've just shown you. So you see the bulk of the yield response last year came from the November overspray, uh, and that waiting to spring last year would have, been, would have been the wrong answer. This year, again, interesting, and there's quite a lot of disease out there in our trials. So I think a similar pattern, the, the disease has established early this year, um, which may give these uh, fungicides that work pr protectantly uh, a bit more of an issue. So um, the data that we've got is, is 2015 and 16 data that you've, you've seen before because, like I say, the, the trial data last year wasn't that informative. What it's telling you, though, is that we have this range of products. You see that those curves are not as tight as we've been looking at in the cereals, so we are struggling somewhat to manage light leaf spot, but we're getting good control from a range of, of products there. So you've got an azole, uh, another azole there. Uh, and then you've got these strabilurin uh, SDHI mixes. Now, it was, it was useful not to be so reliant on azoles, but actually, sadly, we've lost Rafinzer. So that strabilurin in that lost approval. Um, so that's a miss that that's gone. Here are your yield responses. Uh, and like I say, your standard program would be autumn followed by spring. Uh, and again, linked to the risk, you're in a higher risk region here. So moderate your dose with the region and with the varietal rating that you've, you've put in the ground. Uh, that just slide just summarizes what I've said. Um, the spring epidemic last year wasn't as severe in previous years. I think we're in a very similar scenario this, this year. So your autumn sprays will have been um, quite important. For all, we didn't get big differences between uh, products last year. We did see the later applications reducing stem and pod uh, disease severity, which again is a sort of sting in the tail from, from light leaf spot. Sclerotinia stem rot, I mean, again, you've got issues with sclerotinia historically in the Northeast with, you know, infections sitting there in rotations. Um, it does give us an example, though, where we can perhaps move away from azole chemistry. So, you often find the systemicity of, of prothioconazole useful. Uh, Phelan works purely preventatively. 
um, and, you, and you see the efficacy of the products there. But if you can, try and think about alternating and moving away from azoles for your flowering sprays, because for all you're not targeting light leaf spot, it will still be there in the crop and exposed to that azole chemistry. So certainly if you're using more than one mid-flowering spray, try and uh, use an alternation of chemistry. Obviously, the infection risk is, is very dependent on weather during flowering, and we know the risk of, of wet weather and petals sticking and so on and so forth. Again, it's another example where fungicides work best protectantly, so you need to be on ahead of that infection risk. Um, Dose-wise, I mean, we've always worked around the half dose as being the sort of minimum, and that will give you about a fortnight's control. So bear that in mind. If you're looking for longer, if you're doing a single flowering spray and you're wanting three weeks plus, then start to come up the dose rate and think maybe of more like um, three-quarter rate um, products. Range of choices there, though, so try and alternate. And thinking of strategies for 2018, like I say, I think we're in a similar scenario to last year. We've got early sown crops and we're at risk of light leaf spot. Lesions were there early in the trials. Try and practice anti-resistance management where you can. Um, and we do see a benefit to higher doses uh, on the Scottish fungicide performance sites in this series. So we know we're at risk of light leaf spot. I'm not telling you anything new in saying that. But again, you know, it's about monitoring crops and reacting to, to what you're seeing out there. So if I finish by saying a bit about um, stewardship and, and integrated pest management. Integrated pest management has a, ba you know, a, a bad press. It's seen as a bit kind of woolly and out there. Um, but actually, I mean, none of us would disagree with these tenants. It's about you know, managing disease in a smart way, maximizing the efficacy of, of what you're doing and trying to minimize the costs and the impact on the environment. That's all worthy and good stuff. And when you think of that in, in the context of the arable crops that you're growing, you know, you, you've got the, the more general um, methods which we, you know, protect and enhance beneficial organism, organisms, and we'll hear about, you know, pollinators and so on later. But you're all thinking about crop rotations. We've seen a better uptake of resistant varieties. Um, you're using uh, healthy seed or certified seed. You're monitoring, you're getting information from the press and from what you're seeing yourself and your own crops. And we work through to some of the more targeted approaches to, you know, you're thinking about the programs and the dose rates and tailoring that to the risk that you're looking at. That's all part of IPM. It's not something out there or another. It's, it's what you're doing at the moment. And we've, you know, we've, we've launched this IPM tool, an online planning tool. Um, so that's been there for a year or so now. But I would encourage you to have a look at that and fill it in. It's a nice job for a, a dull January day. It shouldn't take you long, and it, w it will help you pick out what you're doing already and, and identify things that you could maybe start to pick up. Sustainability and stewardship is something that you know, consumers are interested in. So you know, it's become part as a recommendation in SQC certification. You know, the public are interested in, in this side of it. And like I say, we're all doing good stuff, so it's important that that gets captured and recorded. So I promised I would finish by saying a little bit about uh, fungicide resistance. So I don't need to dwell on this kind of roll call of shame, but we've seen all these different diseases starting to tumble to our active chemistry. Um, so we're not in a great position, but it's not without hope. So there are things that we can, we can do. Um, and if you look at a couple of case studies, I mean, we know we've got issues with Septoria. We know we've done the wrong thing, so we've grown these great high-yielding varieties, but with real weaknesses for Septoria. And chemistry's got us out of that hole, but we've got to where we've got to by being so reliant on chemistry. And we do sadly get a lot of anecdotal reports of less than ideal practice. So some of that's forced on us. We have to use azoles throughout the program. We don't have options. But other things like the SDHIs, you know, where I hear scary stories of people using a strong SDHI and not supporting it, I think, well, that leaves the individual open to things like rust and to resistance failures. Um, but it also leaves generically, it puts us all at risk because it's starting to erode that chemistry and expose it. Um, and we know that Septoria is high risk. It's got a history of developing problems. So, you know, there are win-wins for the individual in doing the sensible thing and win-wins for all of us. New chemistry is sadly very limited. It's hard to get new stuff on the market now, but we're only two or three years away from new stuff arriving. Um, so we're not looking at some kind of, you know, let's do the right thing today in the hope of some, you know, brave new world 20 years hence. 
we're looking at trying to bridge for two or three years. So if we're sensible now, we've actually got a target that we could, we could get to and start to you know, get some relief um, from the pressure on our, our current chemistry. Similarly, if you look at barley, we've got that sort of back record of eroding the chemistry we've got. Barley, you're working with multiple disease targets, um, but we do have a greater number of active groups. So we still have you know, better efficacy from strabilirins. You've got saprodinol, you've still got morpholines in that mix. So genuinely, you've got a chance to mix and max chemistry and actually target that spread of diseases too. So again, there's a win-win for the individual that you can target a range of diseases, but by using that mixture and alternation of chemistry, you're helping yourself and you're helping the, the industry um, by trying to you know, protect and steward chemistry. And again, you can see that roll call of, of emerging issues. So, I mean, I, I think it's interesting. There's a lot of information out there on fungicide resistance and what's happening. And, you know, we bang on about the bad news every year. And then we still get this poor practice. And you look at pesticide statistics and you see, you know, the, the wrong stuff being done. So I chair this group, the Fungicide Resistance Action Group, and it kind of sets out, you know, we know what the principles of fungicide resistance are and we know what the issues are. But there's somehow there's a gap between translating that into what you actually need to know and to do in the field at each individual um, spray and decision timing. So for the year coming, the AHDB is going to put some money into their terming at Fungicide Futures. So trying to put messages out at key timings that help translate that kind of perhaps slightly worthy information in the resistance action group out into what you need to know uh, in practice and, and to maybe get over, you know, is this about, do you need more information? Does it need to be more practical? Are the messages too complex, too simple? Um, there's certainly a lot of mixed messaging out there. So people put their own slant on things depending on, you know, what their angle is. And I don't think that helps. I mean, you will certainly disengage. You think, well, if experts can't agree, I'll just bash on and do what I do. Um, so I'm really interested to see how this initiative does. So watch out for things badged as fungicide futures. Part of this about, is about getting journalists engaged as well so that we don't get kind of off piste stories uh, in the press, that we get sort of sensible um, measured approaches that give you, give you that stronger anti-resistance advice. Um, and various you know, useful links. So the first major activity is going to be around T0 in winter wheat next year, uh, and watch out for that. Um, but like I say, for me, it's about how you start to apply these, these principles in practice. So we understand what the high-level anti-resistance principles are. You know, we're trying to use all available methods, and that's using resistant varieties and using your agronomy to just inherently reduce the risk, and then tailoring what you're doing within each crop and risk situation. And, and again, it's an example of, of integrated pest management in practice. Trying to use a range of active groups where you can. Balanced mixtures are really important. Again, if we, if we look at the wheat situation, having that ASOL backbone supporting the SDHIs um, is a really key uh, approach uh, where, again, there are win-wins for the individual and for you know, the industry generically. We're trying to alternate where we can that's hard in wheat where we're so reliant on a very few groups, but it is more possible in oilseed rape and in, in barley. Doses, um, you know, the principle of fungicide resistance is basically the more chemical you use, the more you pull the population in the direction you don't want. But you have to use the doses that you use to, to do the job that you need to do. Reducing the dose, if that's possible because you're in a low risk situation, that's fine from a resistance management point of view. In fact, that probably reduces the risk of resistance. What we don't want though is multiple repeat dose programs. So you reduce the dose so far that you have to start slotting in a T1 and a half or a T4 or something where things run out of steam. Keep that in mind. Using the multi-sites is really important as well. So they are a safe haven when it comes to resistance management. So for winter wheat, again, I've tried to pick out the win-wins. Using the multi-sites is sensible. Um, they're cheap. Um, they build insurance. They build disease control into your programs, but they also steward those higher risk bits of chemistry. Extra timings add cost for you, and they do help to fuel resistance. So really think hard. Do you need a T0? Um, if you can sensibly target leaf three in wheat, you've grown a variety that's got good yellow rust resistance, and you're not seeing much septoria, you could probably do without a T0. 
It's a less responsive timing. And, but you would keep it for the, the situations where you know you're at high risk and you've early drilled or you're worried about yellow rust. So think about that one. I highlighted the SDHI at T1. That's another decision for you. Again, you will need it in some situations, but it adds cost if you're in a low-risk situation. So really think about where you target that extra chemistry. And similarly, we can pick out some sort of best practice ideas for barley for next year. So you've got that wider range of actives. You can use your balanced mixtures um, to manage, you know, rhincosporium and net blotch, where we've got a moving situation that Neil highlighted. There are a lot of changes in the barley sensitivities to fungicides. So that gives you risks as an individual. So using balanced chemistry and hedging your bets is, to my mind, just a really sensible approach. Again, use multi-sites where you can, and for barley, that really is more about chlorophalnol, which is the more effective of the multi-sites in that crop. So to sum up, you're basically doing everything you can to reduce disease pressure before you get to the point of having to use chemistry. Value that varietal resistance, so factor that into the decisions that you're making. Um, don't play fast and loose with new, new chemistry. So these slightly scary stories about SDHIs, that brings you risks as an individual, and it does expose all of us to a risk of losing the SDHIs before we get through to, to new chemistry being available. So take resistance seriously, follow the guidelines. Statutory limits are obviously compulsory, so you're sticking to limits and doors and, and application number. And for next year, I mean, keep ahead of developments. You know, the, it, we're in a moving situation, so we'll try and get stuff into the press uh, in as timely a way as we can. So keep on top of that type of information and try and adjust uh, programs to suit what you're, what you're reading. Skating close to the edge puts us all at risk, so pick out those win-wins that I've tried to highlight, uh, and we can all work together in this. And as I say, if we can extend the life of existing chemistry, we, we can bridge to that new chemistry coming uh, and be in a better position uh, rather than this sort of currying, current worrying um, position that we're in at the moment. So thank you very much. <laughs>